Welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Lee Lowry, and I'm the Executive Director of the American School Health Association. Today's webinar, Head Lice Treatment, Heading Off an Ancient Adversary, is a timely webinar to help school professionals prepare for this problem in the new school year, which is when it is quite prevalent. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about the American School Health Association, otherwise known as ASHA. We are the only organization that addresses multiple disciplines in school health and that is devoted solely to school health. Our membership of approximately 700 individuals represents school health as administrators at the local, state, and national levels, as health and education professionals in a pre-K through 12 school setting, and as academics conducting research that informs school health professionals. We're also the proud publishers of the Journal of School Health, a premier journal in the area of school and adolescent health. Members of ASHA can elect to receive a hard copy or an electronic copy of the journal. Our membership fee is inexpensive and provides you access to the journal and also to our weekly e-newsletter, School Health Action, as well as free continuing education hours through approved webinars like today's and through CE qualifying Josh Cert articles. If you haven't already, please consider joining, volunteering, and becoming a member of the ASHA community. Visit us at ashaweb.org to learn more. Registration is now open for you to join and meet like-minded school health professionals for our 2016 conference, which will be held during October 6th through 8th in Baltimore, Maryland. We offer the following four tracks during the conference. Administration coordination and leadership, programs and services, research and emerging issues, and teaching and learning. Visit ashaweb.org and regi register today as an early bird attendee to save $55 off your registration. Now, for a little bit about a framework that unites ASHA's diverse membership. ASHA believes that schools have a responsibility to meet the needs of the whole child. The whole school, whole community, whole child, or WISC model, developed jointly by the CDC and ASCD, provides a framework for the health and education sectors at the state and local levels to work towards stronger alignment, integration, and collaboration. This approach puts the students in the center. The goal is to ensure that all students are safe, healthy, engaged, supported, and challenged. This holistic and synergistic approach requires schools, students, families, and community partners to focus on improving both health and educational outcomes and to create schools that nurture and support all students. It is a team effort and collaboration is the key to success. A multidisciplinary approach that involves school nurses, counselors, health educators, physical educators, community experts, administrators, and students can better leverage resources and expertise to address the needs of the whole child, meeting the child's physical, emotional, social, and academic needs. Using the knowledge and wisdom of this school health team, schools can develop policies and programs that support all students, keep them safe from physical or emotional harm, and empower them to take responsibility for their own health and well-being. All of ASHA's webinars tie back to this model, and today's topic of head lice treatment is no exception, as it touches upon the health education, health services, family engagement, and social and emotional climate components of this framework. A couple of notes before we begin. Your phones will remain muted for the 60 minute duration of this webinar. If you have any questions, please type them in the questions box on the left hand screen and we will try to address them at the end of today's presentation. We're recording today's session and we will send you links to the recording additional resources and to the evaluation survey within the next couple of days. Now let's get started. We are pleased to have Wendy Wright with us this evening. Wendy is a 1992 graduate of the Adult Primary Care Nurse Practitioner Program at Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts and completed a Family Nurse Practitioner Postmasters Program in 1995. She is an adult and family nurse practitioner and the owner of two nurse practitioner owned and operated clinics within New Hampshire named Wright and Associates Family Healthcare with two locations at Amherst and Concord. In addition, she's the owner of Partners and Health Education, a medical education company. She is the past president of NPACE and the senior lecturer for Fitzgerald Health Education Associates. 
please take it away. Hi, everyone, Wendy. and Thank welcome you. this evening. I hope you can all hear me. And again, I'm sorry if there was a little bit of a delay in me jumping in, but I'm hoping you can all hear me okay. My name is Wendy Wright, as you heard, and I'm a family nurse practitioner. And I'm going to speak with you this evening about head life treatment, heading off an ancient adversary. So over the course of the next 45 minutes, what I'd like to do is outline for you this program. I'm going to ask Lee to advance my slide for me, and we will take a look at the presentation outline for the course of the next 45 or so minutes. We're going to talk a little bit about head life. We're going to talk about the approaches to head life treatment and the role of all of us as healthcare professionals in the treatment of head life management. And last, I want to provide you with some educational resources that are available to all of us as we're treating these patients. Lice are, are with us, and lice are going to occur wherever there are humans. In fact, lice are the most common, most prevalent parasitic infection among humans. They're pervasive. And in fact, if we take a look at that next slide, we know that they are most common among school-age children. In fact, every year, there's about 6 to 12 million infestations that occur between 3 and 11 years of age. The reason for this age group, and again, it's more common in females, is because three to 11 year olds have not often grasped the concept that we shouldn't put our heads necessarily up against other children's heads, et cetera. But if I'm going to do anything with you tonight, I want to dispel a lot of myths regarding head life. And the first takeaway message is that head life is an equal socioeconomic parasite. What I mean by that is, you can be wealthy and you can be um, impoverished and are still susceptible to lice. So it's not, people have this perception that lice is often occurs in people that are dirty. And in fact, that is absolutely not the case. In fact, lice really prefer uh, clean heads. So we know that they're more common in children. We know that they're more common in very clean heads and that they affect all socioeconomic groups and all healthy hosts. So let's take a look, a closer look at this little critter. The adult louse is about two to three millimeters in size. It's the size of a sesame seed. And they're usually tan to grayish white. However, when they begin to engorge with blood, what we know is that they can actually take on the color of the hair around them, and they'll become darker and can really blend in with the hair. This is really important because this is how this parasite has gone on to survive for so very long. And you will see here that we've given you a picture of the egg and compared it to the size of a penny. And even when you look at the size of the adult louse, you can see that it is so very small, even in comparison with, uh, with a penny. So what happens is when the, when the louse, the adult louse, lays her egg, we call these nits, she's going to lay that egg very close to the human scalp. In fact, usually within a half centimeter to a centimeter. The reason for that is once that egg hatches, it must take what we call a blood bath within the first hours of its life. It does, if it does not take a blood bath, meaning feed off of the human host, it's not going to survive. So a lot of people think lice are in the carpets, they're, in, uh, they're on the sofas. The reality is that while they may fall off, it is almost impossible because once they're off a for us to pick them up from carpeting, et cetera, because once they're off the human host, they're unable to survive, and in fact, they survive less than one day on room temperature. We're going to look now for just a moment at the life cycle of the head louse. And I've mentioned a little bit about this, but if you'll just follow along with me for a second, you'll see that up at the very top, these are your adult lice. And that female is going to lay her eggs about one or two days actually after she mates. She is capable of laying up to 10 eggs a day. So she's going to mate. One to two days later, she's going to lay that egg, and she may lay 10 a day. She's going to lay that egg, as I mentioned to you, very close to the scalp so that it can feed. 
and the egg is going to hatch 7 to 12 days later. And it hatches actually by biting a hole in its outer casing. It takes a deep breath. It blows that breath backwards. And that's what expels it actually out of that, that shell that you see at the bottom of this slide. It's then under, it's called a nymph. It's going to undergo a multitude of stages. And you can see that it becomes an adult stage or an adult louse nine to 12 days after it hatches. It's then going to go on to mate. And this is how that cycle is repeated. The average female lives three to four weeks. You do the math, 28 days. 10 eggs a day, you can understand why it can become very easy. And then you add other adults on board for the children, for their heads to become totally infested with life. So let's go to this next slide and let's talk for just a moment about transmission. Because I know there's a lot of myths about transmission as well. I remember when my son was little, I was the first mom on the baseball team to go out and buy him his own helmet. And I used to say to him, you do not share your helmet with anyone. Do not share your hats, et cetera. And while I always worried about that and certainly worried about combs and brushes, the majority of the transmission actually appears or occurs when there's direct head-to-head -head contact with an infested individual. So, Again, while it can be spread in other ways, it's often during sleepovers where kids are laying next to each other or in the games that they're playing where they're putting their heads up against each other. I've had parents in my clinic that have said to me, I know where my kid got head lice from. The reality is many parents really don't know where their kid gets head lice from because it can take four to six weeks for the itching to occur after that child has has been exposed to head lice because if a child has never had head lice before, they have to really become more sensitized and that itching can take four to six weeks for it to occur. If a child has had head lice before, it's within about 48 hours that they will actually begin to itch and kind of scratch at that at their head. It is also possible for children, although we don't see this very often here in the United States, it's also possible for them to develop secondary infections, such as an impetigo or a staph type infection from the itching. Let's go to this next slide and let me show you a picture of what head lice really look like on the scalp. And what I want you to see when you look at this slide on the left hand side, or this picture on the left, is that this is the unhatched egg. When that female lays her eggs, what she does is she has this secretion that she excretes from her female genitalia. So she lays her egg, this substance come out, comes out of her female genitalia that is equivalent to a cement-like mixture. It's what attaches those eggs so firmly onto the hair shaft. It's what also makes those mitts so very, very difficult to get off of those hair shafts because we actually don't have any chemical that is known to us that actually is able to break that cement bond. So you can see how these lights and these mitts have learned to live over the years. This is a girl here on the right-hand side of this picture. She's a 10-year-old girl who's been complaining of itching of her scalp for weeks. Within that white circle, you can see that there are numerous mitts, and within the black circle, which is above the ear, you can actually see that there's some of this scaly material. This is actually fecal material that is located within that black circle. So this is your typical uh, appearance. I always tell my staff that when we're looking for nits and looking for head lice, it's always good to look at the nape of the neck and behind the ears because this is very protecting to them and this is where you'll often see the infestations if you're going to see them. One of the most important features of tonight's lecture is to talk about making the diagnosis of head lice. And the American Academy of Pediatrics, as you'll see on this next slide, is really asking all of us as healthcare professionals to not make the diagnosis of head lice over the phone. And it was so interesting. I was just giving a talk a few weeks ago, not even about head lice, but someone raised their hand and they said, you know, I don't want people with head lice in my clinic. I don't want people with X, Y, and Z in my clinic. Head lice are not going to jump off someone's scalp and infest those of us that are healthcare providers. I would actually rather see someone with head lice than I'd rather see 
someone with flu in my office because these are not contagious unless I put my head up against them. So we are asking people to really make that definitive diagnosis by either by finding a live louse or nymph on that child's scalp or head. If we find that that knit is attached more than a centimeter from the scalp, it is very unlikely in this country that that head louse or that knit is going to be able to survive. Now in warmer climates, i.e. in the Caribbean or in other locations, we may actually see that they can survive longer. But here in the United States, what we know is that if that knit is more than a centimeter from the shaft or from the scalp, it is likely not going to survive. This is another message I want you to take away is that when we see knits that are three centimeters away from the scalp, the average human hair grows a centimeter a month. And because that knit is going to be laid within a centimeter of that child's scalp, I know that this child is likely have those knits on their head for three months, very likely, because the hair grows a centimeter a month. If it's three centimeters away, I know this has been going on for months. So we're looking to make the diagnosis by noting something that is alive. It's also possible that they have left those little knit casings uh, on, around the scalp. But what I find is a lot of times people will call me up and they'll say, my kid has head lice, but when I bring them in, it's actually dandruff. Or what I actually find more often is it's gel products. It's leftover hairspray. It's leftover gels and lotions that people are using in their hair. One other thing before we move on, because I want to clear up one other misnomer or some misinformation about lice. Head lice actually occur a lot less in the African American or black population. And it has nothing, people often think it has something to do with the oil of the hair or the texture of the hair. It actually isn't. It's the hair shaft. The hair shaft is actually shaped more triangular in African Americans, and as a result, the knit is not able to attach to that hair shaft as well. So, in fact, I told you that, you know, head lice is an equal socioeconomic parasite. It actually doesn't occur equally across all races. We tend to see head lice actually less in the African American population. Let's talk now about the impact of head lice in terms of direct and indirect costs. Because there's a lot of money that is spent every single year on treating head lice. And then what we also need to do is factor in some of those indirect costs. Because these schools that have no knit policies, they keep the kids out of school until those knits have been completely removed from the head. This is so costly to the parents who often have to stay out of work. And I don't know about the parents that you work with, but a lot of the parents that I see, if they don't work, they're not paid. So the direct cost of the medication is huge, but so too are the indirect costs, the cost of missing work, the cost of missing school. And I want you to leave here tonight with the message that we are asking schools to eliminate no knit policies. They have not been shown to be effective. And what we're asking people to do is once these kids have been treated with, with head lice medication, we are asking that they be allowed to return to school because even if there are nits still on the scalp, the majority of them or on the hair shaft, the majority of them are probably not going to hatch. 12 to 24 million school days are missed every year because of head lice. And it is said that the average person treats their child up to five times before they ever consult with a healthcare professional. So our job is to correct some of this misinformation, but also drive these parents toward their healthcare provider. Because many of us that do this work, we know that there are often more cost-effective options. And more importantly, we also know that there are options that these folks can do in less time to be able to get these kids back into school. So let's take a look at the next slide, and let's talk about some approaches to head lice treatment. Oftentimes, and I give my school nurses credit because the school nurses in my community are really the authorities on head lice. They are the ones that are dealing with this all the time. They're the ones that for years 
have conducted these headlight screening programs where everyone lines up. And I remember this as a kid. You line up in the nurse's office, and everyone, and they look at your scalp, and you're sent home if you have headlights. But you know what? Those programs have also not been shown to be effective. They've not been shown to curtail the spread of head lice in the school. So as a result, we're asking that people abandon those kind of programs as well. But again, let's go back to this. The school nurse is the authority. He or she is dealing with this all the time. They're also dealing with the angry parents who have gotten letters that there's head lice in the school. They're also having to deal with the other, you know, the other caregivers. So we're asking that school nurses have this latest information about the policies that are recommended so that, again, they can drive these parents or their caregivers in to get care more quickly. You can see here that 70% of households are going to treat on their own. And this is where we get, uh, we know that people go out to the Internet, and all you have to do is Google something. You're going to be able to find a million ways to treat anything, much of which has no basis whatsoever in science. So a lot of times, if they don't consult with the school nurse, they're going to go out to the Internet. They're going to try to figure it out themselves because no parent wants to say to another parent, my kid has head lice. So they don't talk to each other because it's embarrassing to them. Or the other place they'll go is to a pharmacist. And in my community, in fact, I've had a couple of parents who said, I didn't talk to the pharmacy here. I went to the pharmacy in Massachusetts because I did not want to have anyone know that my kid was the one with head lice. So they drove 17 miles down the street to be able to get their kid head lice medicine because they didn't want to have to get it in our community. Only 30% of households are actually con actually contact a health care provider first. And even when they do, 46% of the time, they're actually directed to use an over-the-counter medication first. So there are so many choices out there now to treating head lice. I want to share with you on this next slide a chart of the different options that are available. And we're going to start with over-the-counter products known as permethrin or pyrethrin. I'm sure you've heard of these. These are called NICs and RID. These two products are sold over-the-counter without a prescription. If we read the package insert on the appropriate use of these medications, they both should be used once. The nit should be combed out every day until they're gone, and then the child or the adult should be retreated again at the two-week mark. My experience with these over-the-counter products is people are quick to use them the first time. They're not always quick to treat at that two-week mark, and that may be one of the reasons that we're not eradicating head lice as effectively as we should be. Many of you that are my age, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, you may remember a shampoo called Lindane. I remember it being sold as a child as Quell. We really are not using this first line anymore. It does have some neurotoxicity. What we are now using are products like Malathion. This is sold as Ovide. We're using benzyl alcohol, Ulexia. We're using Spinosad or Natroba. And the one I do want to talk with you about tonight is Slice or ivermectin. So these are your five prescription products, but really for all intents and purposes, we really are only using the bottom four. So let's look at how these different prescription products, what they're indicated for and how we're using them and how we're applying them. So as I mentioned to you before, Lindane shampoo is more neurotoxic. So if we can go to this next slide, Lee, I think the, the participants will be able to see kind of how these all lay out. In terms of the Lindane, we'll apply the one to two ounces depending upon the hair length. And what also happens is it, we're going to leave it on. It takes about four minutes. They don't get retreated. All right, let's go on to some of the other products that we really use more often. So malathion is not uh, indicated for under six years. So there's one of the limiting factors because I told you we tend to see head lice in three, four, five-year-olds. This product is not un indicated under six years of age. It's left on for eight to 12 hours and the treatment is repeated in seven to nine days if the lice continue to be present. It's sold actually in two ounce bottles and their parents are instructed to apply enough to, their, uh, to the wet hair and to the scalp to cover the entire hair. 
Then there's benzoyl alcohol. This is indicated six months of age and older, but the amount that we dispense is actually dependent upon the length of the child's hair. It's also a benzoyl alcohol, and it's highly flammable. So I always tell parents, keep this away from any fires, keep this away from any flames, because this is highly flammable, and it should be repeated uh, after seven days. Spinosad is known as Nitroba, has a six-month indication. This is a 10-minute 10, uh, 10 treatment just like ivermectin or splice is, and it's repeated in ten, seven to ten, seven days or so if head lice are still present. And last is ivermectin, approved down to six months of age. This is splice. It's dispensed in a lotion, so it comes available in one tube, and it's applied for 10 minutes. And then if the child is needing to be retreated, the parents are encouraged to contact the healthcare provider to make a decision whether treatment should be reperformed or not. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of all of the home remedies that parents are trying. And I Wendy, have to be honest. Wendy, with, this is yeah. Lee. Can, can, I just wanted to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to make sure you could hear my voice. I can hear your voice. Thank you for okay. chiming in. I really appreciate it. Am, are you guys all able to hear me okay? Yes, we can. I think that we can hear you. I believe, I'm sorry, I want to apologize for the technical difficulties. I know that folks couldn't hear me in the beginning of the presentation. I just wanted to, we, we made some tweaks and I wanted to make sure that someone could hear me now so that we can be sure to answer all the questions that will come at the end of the session. So I will, Thank you. I will mute I'm, myself and let you keep going. I love it. Thank you so much. Okay. That's great. I'm glad you chimed in. So great. let's jump back in and talk about some of these home remedies or natural products because I'll tell you, I get questions about these all the time. I get asked about things like margarine or petroleum jelly or vinegar-based products. And I think I was starting to tell you, I remember as a child, and even today you still hear about children that catch on fire because their parents are putting kerosene on their on their hair and scalp. Obviously, that is not recommended, and people can be incredibly harmed by it. You may have heard of people doing a Cetaphil program. What I think is really important for all of us to take away is that, that none of these are, have been scientifically evaluated in randomized trials. We don't know how efficacious they are, nor are any of those regulated by the FDA. There is also a number of other products out there um, that indicate or are indicated to, to be able to remove nits and lice. Again, what I would tell you is that many of these are not regulated. What's become of is also, can you still hear me, I hope? I'm going to keep going. I just got some invalid uh, comments. But what has also become very common are these nitpicking salons. And you may have heard of this uh, over, the, over different parts of the country. I know we have one of them here in, the, in New Hampshire. And these have really sprung up all over the country. You can see from, uh, as we move on to this next slide, that these are these salons that actually charge up to $100 an hour. They're going to use a natural or chemical-free approach. They're going to actually remove the nits. They're going to do these comb outs. They're going to apply hot air. Again, it's a very unregulated industry. And I've heard parents pay four, $500 to go into these salons. I'm the medical director of a camp here in New Hampshire. And every summer, we have about 500 to 600 kids that come to this camp. And despite the fact that I tell the camp directors, we don't need to do these head light screenings. The parents are so insistent on it that this camp hires nurses to come into the camp, and the first day, they go through every child's head, and if the child is infested, they actually do the comb outs, they do the treatments, and, and we're, they're paying up to $100 an hour for this. So, again, these have sprung up all over the United States, and really what they are growing out of is parents' frustration with regard to the fact that what they're using is not working well. So that's a great segue. Let's move on to why some cases of head lice persist despite the treatments that we offer them. And we know uh, that many people use over-the-counter products, and I'm going to tell you tonight that the efficacy of the over-the-counter products is decreasing. 
And it's decreasing because just like what we're seeing in the world of antibiotics, we're seeing mutations and we're seeing resistance that is cropping up in headlights. When we look at other treatments people use, look at this, 16% use home remedies and natural products. About 1% use a lice, a lice or knit removal service. About 10% comb knit. 10% use prescription products. So what really drives a consumer's decision as to what to use is often ease of use, it's often cost, and it's often what they're able to be advised to use by their pharmacists or by school nurses or even by other family members. So let's go to this next slide. Why is it that some cases persist? Well, first of all, I mentioned this to you earlier. I've seen people who swear their kids have had lice. When I bring them in, they don't have had lice at all. What they thought was were knit are not knit. But there's also this uh, lack of adherence to the recommended treatment option. They don't use enough to saturate the hair because when I see families who are who income is a real issue for them, they pick up a product and they often will share it among other family members rather than using the entire product on one child because it is expensive. You have to treat your child with some of these over-the-counter products. We're talking up to $50. And if you've got two or three or four kids, it is not inexpensive. We also know that after kids are treated, they go back to school and they hang with the same kids who may not have been treated, and they can certainly reacquire the infection. And there isn't any product that we have, both prescription or over-the-counter, that is 100% ovicidal, meaning to kill the parasites uh, or to kill those nits. Not, we don't have any of those products that are 100%. And as I alluded to before, resistance is developing. And we now know that resistance has been reported to the products like Lindane, I mentioned Quell to you before, Pyrethrin, which is RID, Permethrin, which is NYX, and Malathione. So we have resistance already reported. And again, it's not unanticipated. We're seeing this with antibiotics and the bugs becoming smarter than the antibiotics and mutating, and we, we, we expect it with this. We don't know the actual prevalence of resistance, and it changes location to location, but I want to give you a little bit of information on resistance because I really do believe it helps to explain why not everyone gets better after we treat them. So this was a study that was actually conducted in 2009, and it was a randomized, blinded, uh, control trial where they compared 0.9% spinosad without knit combing, that's Natroba, to a 1% permethrin with knit combing. So spinosad is the prescription product. They were asked not to comb knit. Permethrin is the over-the-counter product, and they were asked, known as NYX, and they were asked to actually comb out knits with this product. There were 1,000 patients that were studied. There were two different trials. They were looked at 14 days after treatment, and look at the difference. 44, 42% of those treated with the over-the-counter product, even when knit combing was done, were head light free. Compare that to the prescription product, where 85-ish, 80, 86% were light free, even when knits were not combed. So I think... It makes us wonder why. Well, let's continue on and let's take a look at this next slide where we look at the declining efficacy in the over-the-counter product, particularly permethrin. This is kind of a busy slide. I want to orient you. If you look all the way over on the left of this slide at the very top, this is the percentage of patients that were lice-free after treatment with permethrin. And this was back in 1984 through about 1994, almost 100%. Now I want you to look at the green bar on the right-hand side of your slide starting at around 1999. And let's take a look at that declining efficacy. And you can see by 2009, it was down below 40%. So what accounts for that? Now you're gonna look at that brown line and notice it heading down. When it heads down, it means that more of the lice 
we're showing mutations or resistance as a result of mutation. So you can see by 2014, almost 100% of those were uh, res showing resistance or mutation. Let's take a closer look at this. This was a study done, and this is going to be a map of the United States. This was a study done looking at this mutation frequency because it's the mutation that is actually believed to confer resistance in these lights. And so where you see the bright red circles that are completely filled in all red, these were lights that were 100% resistant or had, had this mutation, which means it's going to confer resistance. You can see that there aren't a lot of little yellow pies to those charts any longer. And so, again, just going to show that there are mutations conferring high degrees of resistance. Let's now go to this next map. And this is a map of the United States. And this is looking at state by state. And they took life samples across the country. And you can see that almost every one of these dots is red, meaning that up to 100% of those lights that were sampled, so 42 out of 40 states, 48 states, what we saw here was that all but six of them showed a mean resistance of 100%. That's, that's incredible. We know that there were only six states where that resistance was below 100%. And if you actually take a look at this next slide, slide you can see that even those states where, the, where not all of the mutations or not all of the lights were 100% resistant, you can see that anywhere from 60 up to 87% were, with Michigan being the outlier. I have no idea why it was the outlier. So let's wrap tonight up by talking about the role of the healthcare professional. And that includes all of us, whether we are providers, whether we are nurses, whether we work in the schools um, as you know, guidance counselors, whether we work as teachers. That includes every single one of us here in this room. And I've mentioned a lot of these, but I think what we need to do is just break it down real quickly. We are asking that diagnoses not be made by parents alone, that healthcare providers and professionals get involved in making that diagnosis so that we are not advising people to use medicine that they don't need. We know that there is the emergence of resistance, mostly to over-the-counter products, but I just told you we now have two products that we know of have already begun to show resistance as well. Healthcare providers and my peers, peers need to be knowledgeable about the healthcare options that are available. It does us no good when the parent has already tried an over-the-counter product and has used it two or three or four times, the headlights are continuing and they're advised by whoever they speak to in a healthcare provider's office will go ahead and pick that up again. We need people to understand that there are options available and we need to, to be able to advise people on the proper use of different medications. Let's look at this next slide on, on, again, some of the guidance. We are looking at the treatment options that are available. I make my recommendations based on efficacy, how easy is it to use, the cost of it, the resistance rates. And while over-the-counter products are still recommended for people as first line, because they do work for some people. You saw from that previous slide that 40% responded. That means 60% did not. So while it's okay to start with it, if it does not work, it's time to think about moving these folks up the chain and trying other products. Again, just to reiterate, we don't know the resistance in all of our communities, but again, I hope I've shown you that we do know that it is occurring. The next big takeaway message that I mentioned earlier is we really do want to try to keep these kids in school. American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Association of School Nurses has stated no healthy child should be excluded from school or allowed to this time because of head lice. These no-knit policies should be abandoned. We worked for over seven years in our community, my community, to get a big school district to actually remove that no-knit policy. And despite our medical folks presenting the science and talking with these school, this school board, it took up to seven years to actually get the school board to do it. 
How come? Because they didn't want to deal with angry parents. The other thing is, once they did approve that no nip policy, we've been tracking the rates of head lice in the schools because you would assume if the kids are coming back with nits and it was going to be a big deal, we'd see a rise in the number of kids with head lice in the school, and that has not been seen at all. So we should become involved, all of us, in helping our districts to become evidence-based in terms of their policies. Again, if a child says to any one of you, I've, or an adult, I've tried these products, my kid still has head lice, they should consult with a healthcare provider. And we should be taking an active role in helping these families to sort through the treatments that are available. And developing collaborative roles within the community so that we can all work together to dispel some of these myths about head lice. The next slide is some helpful resources for parents and practitioners on head lice. This includes the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Association of School Nurses, and the American Academy of Pediatrics actually released a clinical report in 2015, and the National Association of School Nurses actually has one out in 2016. So there's some great resources out there that really provide us with evidence-based recommendations. So as I wrap up tonight, I want to thank the folks uh, at Santa Fe for supporting this program. And I am just going to mention, because this is, a, this is a program that has been supported, I want to mention that a little bit about the safety information, because I often get asked, well, how safe is slice lotion to use or ivermectin? And one of the great things is that this product has actually been studied down to six months of age. And we know from our clinical trials that adverse reactions are, are often very topical, meaning an uh, irritation of the scalp or dandruff, and it's all under 1%, which is really reassuring because I don't know about you, I want to make sure that the products I'm using on my child are safe. So I want to thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate your patience as we work out, you know, the best laid plans with technology. So I, uh, I hope that this has been helpful for you. And at this point, I'm happy. I think we have about 15 or so minutes left. I'm happy to open this up for questions, Lee. Sure. Thank you so much, Wendy. I just want to check you. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Wonderful. Um, again, I want to apologize uh, once again for the um, muted uh, pre introduction, um, and I appreciate all of you who were able to stick with us. Um, one thing, so uh, Wendy mentioned we're moving into the Q&A session, so please, um, if you take a look on your screen, you should find a question box. Please feel free to go ahead and submit any questions, and we will answer those. And while you're busy doing that, um, some of the things that I shared that nobody could hear at the beginning of the presentation is that we are recording the session. Um, we are planning to send an email out to everybody in the next couple of days. It will include a link to today's recording, so you can share it. You can listen to it again. We'll also include a link to the slides as well as an evaluation survey because um, we want to know what you thought of the session. Um, and so again, at this point, please go ahead and submit your questions. Um, one other thing I did want to clarify, um, I know that Wendy wanted to thank um, the, the organization sponsoring today's webinar, and the organization is Arbor Pharmaceuticals. I'm so um, okay. sorry. I'm so sorry. That is that was such a slip up. Thank you. It yeah. is Arbor. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. So um, I'm just going to go through. Please do go ahead and submit your questions. Um, let's see. The first question is, what is the cost of Sclice for families? Um, I'm so, wondering, Wendy, if you know the answer to that. Yeah, so that's a very hard question for me to answer because, as you all know, today's healthcare environment is so confusing. I we we accept over 30 different insurances in our clinic, um, and everyone has a different copay and a different tier, and it ends up being a lot about what the insurer or the companies are able to negotiate with the insurer. What I often tell my parents is, based on my experience, and I'm only going to speak to you about New Hampshire because that's really what I know and the insurances that I know, is that a product like Slice 
is often less expensive with the copay than uh, than a product that they buy over the counter. Because again, they have to buy it over the counter, they have to treat times two, whereas something like a slice is one time only, and it's a copay. I don't know if my participants here know this, but any branded drug in general, if you Google that name and you say .com, you can often find copays online for whatever brand product it is. There's often discounted cards and discounted copays. That does not apply to government-based programs, so we can't use those for patients that are, have Medicaid. Um, but I'll tell you, in my community, my Medicaid patients, if they failed an over-the-counter product, for them, it's often about $3. So again, it varies insurance to insurance. So Lee, I get very reluctant to give exact numbers because I've seen copays that are $25. I've seen people with $50 copays, but I've also seen $3. Sure. That is um, definitely very true. Um, I will just share an anecdote. Um, I actually was blessed with the wonderful curse of lice in my family this year. Um, and um, one thing I am aware of is that there are coupons that are available. And um, I think uh, we might be able to share share a, uh, a link to coupons um, with, our, with our email that goes out. I can check with Arbor to see if that's possible. But um, there's that option as well in addition to the insurance. And I think, um, I think Lee, I think that mm -hmm. pharmacists often, if people ask, do you have any vouchers, pharmacists mm -hmm. can often get those available as well. Yes, and I actually had the same experience. I had one coupon, and um, a pharmacist helped me find another coupon. So um, that's a very good suggestion. Okay, um, let's see. The next question we have. Um, okay, so I, I see this one a lot, um, and I'm sure that you have too. If you have a student that's been diagnosed with lice, can they remain in school for the rest of the day, or do they need to leave immediately? Do you know? If, yeah. I guess so it would I vary from school to school. That is exactly the truth. It varies school to school. The reality is if the child is there, um, it really does. I mean, they're already been at school. I encourage, and I think most of the school nurses in our district will keep these kids in through the day. They'll let the parents know that this is what's going on. They'll ask the parents to treat that child that evening, but they let the parents know ahead of time so that that parent can place a call to their PCP uh, or to take that child maybe even to urgent care. I know that there are all of these different clinics that are available in pharmacies, et cetera, and that's a place where people will often go in the evenings or the weekends to get access. So the school nurses in our community call the parents, let them know that these have been found, ask them to make an appointment with their provider, get the medicine, but if that child gets treated tonight, that child is able to then come back to school tomorrow. We try not to send them home from school. It is a disruption to the parents' work schedule, and the child's already been there, and just because we find them today, they were there the day before, I promise you. Mm, that's right. That is a very good point. Um, okay, here's a, here's a great question. This is coming from an RN who's having um, a real tough time fighting their administration because they want to go and, and backwards and institute a no-knit policy. And so they're asking if they can use these slides um, to put together a short presentation um, or, you know, so – I happen to know we're going to be sharing the, the link to the recording. We'll be sharing the slides. Um, I don't know if we have anything to say about um, using some of the slides. But well, I, I think that what they should do is there are great references on the bottom of every one of these slides, as well as the no-knit policies, evidence-based recommendations at the very end. I would encourage you all uh, to just whoever asked that question or any of you, this is why we're here tonight, to advocate for these schools to make changes to their policy. I told you it took us seven years, despite evidence that showed it did nothing. Checking people's heads in school, keeping them out of school, has not been shown to improve head lice rates. So um, I encourage you to use them. That's why we're here, and that is the benefit of an educational program such as this tonight. That's it. Exactly right, and that's exactly why we're recording this, and we want you all to share this with you know all of the people in the school that um, you know have to deal with this, and you know your administrations and districts and all of that. Um, okay, uh, the next question we have here is, 
how would you recommend I inform my staff to communicate to parents that their child has the, the live lice or nits? Yeah. So I I encourage people to make a phone call to a parent or send them an email. I know that for years what many schools have also done is not only when they find the headlights, they post these signs on the door. It, it All that does is infuriate parents, and it raises so much anxiety. Why worry about something that you can't prevent necessarily from happening? Uh, and so what I tell people to do is either call or send an email. And I think the key is to just reassure these parents because they're embarrassed and they have to be talked down. Uh, they're very upset by it. And I can, I can totally relate. You know, at the end of a long day, the last thing we want to be doing is treating our kids and combing out their nits at 9 o'clock at night. And it's exhausting. That's one of the things I often talk about with my parents is that a product like Splice, we don't comb, we don't need to comb out yet. And so, you know what, it's a 10-minute application, but it's over with. And so for me, that is it. I would pay $50 to not have to comb out nits every night and to not have to repeat treatment. So I think it's just communicating with them, being, you know what, we see headlights all the time. Don't be embarrassed by this. And I always joked with my parents and said, you know what, this tells me your kid is clean. Because kids that are not clean, they generally don't get life because life doesn't like greasy hair. It likes really clean hair. So look at the bright side. You have a really clean kid. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think you may have answered this next person's question, but we'll go ahead and ask it because um, they're asking you um, – what product you would recommend to a parent who has had lice for the very first time. As a school nurse, what would you do? Uh, would you refer them to their health care practitioner immediately, or would you say just run to the drugstore and grab an over-the-counter? So, I mean, I think if we look at the AAP recommendations, they say people can certainly try over-the-counter. I'll tell you what I do with my parents. I tell them both. I say, here's the advantage of this one. It's over the counter. You don't have to talk to anyone about it. You can pick it up. You call NITS for two weeks and you retreat. If you're willing, call your health care provider. I know for me, we have a telehealth division, so my parents can access a nurse practitioner for us seven days a week, 12 hours a day. We can see the headlights. The parent just holds the phone up. It makes it very, very simple. They don't necessarily have to come in for this, but we, they do see a health care provider, and it's convenient. And then we can send in a prescription for them while we have them over the video conferencing. So, again, I, I give people options because that's what I feel like my job is as a health care provider is to yeah. say, here are, your, here are your options. Which one do you think would work best for you? The problem is people don't always have that conversation, A, because it's insanely busy in primary care for, and for all of us. And, mm -hmm. two, um, people don't have it because they don't always know the advantages of some of the prescription products over the over-the-counter products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can, again, I can speak firsthand to that because um, the only reason that I really knew um, that I could go to a healthcare practitioner was because I helped host this webinar last year, and I heard it firsthand from you and, and learned about it from our corporate member. Um, and so I knew to do it, and um, it made all the difference for me. So. Um, Anyhow, I think yeah. it's, it's important for people agree? to know as an option. And you're a working mom. You get it. You get right. that people are so busy and kids are exhausted and you're exhausted. And who the heck wants to comb out headlights? I remember my mom when I was little. She said, I'm going to cut all your hair off. I lived in such fear with my headlights. Right. And right. you often hear these stories because she's like, ah, I can't get rid of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really frustrating to parent it. And I get it. I just totally get it. It, it is. And, you know, nobody could hear me talking about this in the beginning. Um, I was trying to show the whole school, whole community, whole child model, which is the framework that all of the ASHA members truly believe in um, and that we, you know, we share a common sort of um, uh, 
belief in. And it touches upon all these components that relate to the whole child, and there's just so many of them. I mean, there is, it's, you know, engaging the families, making them aware, um, making sure that the health services people know what's going on and that people are educated. It's, there's just so many facets about this problem that really touch um, all of the areas of, of ensuring that the child is in school and able to learn. Really, it comes back to that. Absolutely, and I think it also comes back to the parents. Because you know what? These parents are trying to work to pay for their kids. You know, I take for it granted. If I miss a day of work, I mean, I do still get paid, but a lot of our parents don't. But what I'll tell you is if I miss a day of work for my kids' head life, that's 50 inpatients who I have to reschedule that day. That's right. a huge inconvenience. And for me, it's not necessarily for me about money, but it's certainly a huge inconvenience. And But I'm blessed. I know that. Um, not every parent has that luxury. And to have to miss work because your kids have nits in their hair, sometimes it's a week before they get out all of these nits. These kids need to be in school and they need to be learning. Right, exactly. Um, okay, here's a, here's a new question. Can you make the diagnosis when you can only detect nits but you cannot find any nymphs? So, there could be nits in there that are never going to hatch. If that child has been treated, the likelihood that many of those nits are never going to hatch is a real possibility. With that said, it's often really hard to find a live louse. So I look for them. I look for those nymphs. I, I hope to find them. But if I find nits in the scalp and that child has told me or the parents that they've been treated before, I don't retreat them. I don't, because they may never hatch. What we know about some of the treatments is, and I can see certainly because I've been trained on ivermectin, but what we know about ivermectin is that it causes paralysis, and, uh, and, and it infiltrates, and that many of them never, ever go on to hatch. I can never tell you it's 100%, because I guarantee nothing in my world these days, but most of them will not go on to hatch. So we're asking people to look for a live blouse or an imp, if they can find one, awesome, it confirms your diagnosis, but just because there's a nit there doesn't mean, as I mentioned to you before, that they're ever going to hatch or that they're alive, because many times those shells, because they're so held on by that cement, are there for months on end. If you see them beyond a centimeter from the scalp, they're not alive, I promise you. Okay, great. Um, we have another uh, question that that I think is a, a, a very popular one, and I, I think that you addressed it, but it may bear um, repeating. Um, but if, if a student in a class has been diagnosed with head lice, this person wants to know if the, if the whole class should be screened. Not at all. The whole class does not need to be screened. Um, and so, because remember, it can take four to six weeks from the time of exposure before they're even having symptoms. So no, the whole and we know this from the headache screen uh, from the head screenings that we do that they haven't been shown to reduce the spread of head lice. So the answer is no. The whole class doesn't need to be screened. There doesn't need to be hysteria. No one needs to wipe everything down with Clorox. Um, what needs to happen is the child needs to be treated. And my opinion is the parents in the classroom don't should not even be notified. That's my opinion. I know other people have different opinions. But all it's going to do is create such anxiety. Every yes. parent who has a child in school knows that head lice is a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very true. Yeah, that, that actually touched upon the next question, which um, talks about how a school sends letters home every time the light, the, the, a student is found with lice. And this particular person doesn't like doing that. Um, and I, I agree with you as a parent receiving those letters. It, it, does, it almost does more harm than good because you just get, a little bit hysterical, you know, and you're... That's exactly true. And we know that, and, and so many of the schools have gone away from that notification because everyone around us knows that head lice exists in schools. At the end of the day, it's not a fatal disease. Yes, I know it requires a lot of work, but we're not dealing with Ebola here. We're not dealing with diseases that are scary. This is head lice. Parents don't need to worry about it. They just don't unless their kid starts to scratch, and then they need to be treated if they find life. 
But uh, a lot of schools have abandoned those letters and the daycares. I've been working a lot with daycares, asking them to stop putting signs on the door. It's like you're entering a hazmat area, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. They're headlights. Parents don't need to worry about that. Yes, and it transfers to the student. You know, then the student and the child feels that um, that anxiety from the parent, and and you don't need to do that to your children. And I've had parents say, "I know it's this child. I know oh, who's doing right. my kid," and they they don't. And it's just mean. It's mean spirited, and it's headlight. <laughs> right. 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 Well, I think that's a good segue to the closing of today's session. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you to everyone for sticking with us as we got through our uh, technology issue here in the beginning. Thankfully, you really didn't miss any of Wendy's presentation. Again, it's recorded. We'll share resources with you in a few days. And thank you all very much. Thank you again, Wendy. Lee, can I make you, a concluding? Arbor. Yeah. Sure. Can yes. I make a concluding remark? Yes, please. Thank you all so very much for taking time out of your evening. I know what it's like to work all day and then come home and try to wolf down your dinner. I really appreciate that this was important to you. Thank you to our friends at Arbor who have supported this program this year. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Lee, for trying to work through all this. I think we ended up doing it and punting, but I hope everyone enjoyed their evening. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you again to Wendy and to Arbor Pharmaceuticals. Goodbye.